Dean, I'm not sure gambling and getting drunk while trying to look for an ex is a good idea for a vacation. Hey, let a man have fun the way he wants. Don't judge me. I'm your brother. Judging you is literally my job. Please, it's not like I do that to you. I learned it by watching you. Whatever, get in the car. Uh, guys? Guys? Ooh, does this mean we get to go on our own adventure? Oh, no adventures until you finish your breakfast. Yay! Adventure, 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 adventure. And action! Hi, my name is Zach, and I heard there's an opening in Supernatural for Zany Demon Sidekick. <laughs> what do you mean only five episodes left? Hey everyone, welcome to the review show where we use toys to make our points because YouTube copyright system can't do shit about it. Um, as you may have noticed, I'm on a little vacation this week, change of scenery around here. I, actually, this table's so nice. There. Nice little backdrop and we won't scratch up the table. What's there to say about this episode? The phrase... The whole is greater than the sum of its part. It's is used to convey something by which each individual piece is perhaps mediocre or not that great, but when it's all brought together, you get an outstanding, exceptional work. This episode is the reverse of that. The whole is way less than the sum of its parts. Jack and Castiel's story was ultimately questionable. The idea that that young preacher's daughter could grab these people and set up such elaborate traps for them is a very tough pill to swallow. For one thing, how did she purchase it all and set it up? I get that part of the point was that her father was neglectful, but how could he not notice funds going missing? Honey, why was this month's rent money spent at Home Depot? My standard is that I don't mind a story leaving a few things up to an imagination or audience extrapolation, but if I have to create an entire additional episode or movie to fix a plot hole and that additional story is entertaining, if not more as the original, I consider that a sign you've messed up. I'm also slightly disappointed that we didn't get to see Castiel and Jack taking more advantage of their powers in solving this. And I'll admit, this is where I'm torn. Summoning a crossroads demon for some answers is clever in a way, and normally I'm one for advocating in a show like this to take advantage of all the tools at the disposal of the characters. But Castiel is an angel whose time with Crowley really probably hasn't been long enough to get over his millennia of enmity toward demons. So ironically, I would say this is one time I would find it quite believable for the characters to deliberately not use this particular tool. A scene where maybe Castiel meditates and tries to scan heavily radio for prayers from the people in trouble would have been nice. Or maybe him going around trying to read people's minds. Or heck, instead of demons, why not question reapers? They probably would have had some answers. This show had a real opportunity here to show us a Sherlock Holmes and Watson with with perceptions of things beyond our regular five senses. And as for Dean and Sam, I try to stress that when there are rules for storytelling, the use of them is far more vital in a collaborative effort. What you do today will impact the next writer tomorrow. And that next writer might actually very well be you. Amara scenes are exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe it's been a while since the first half of the season, but does anybody remember her being brought up before? I double-checked the wiki, and she's not marked as having been mentioned or brought up by anyone, not even the Winchesters, when they didn't have Jack. So why now, all of a sudden, are they remembering her as some part of the grand plan? We haven't seen a plan being formed at all. This should have been addressed sooner. And then... 
as I joked about on Twitter, what thing did Dean and Amara ever have? Oh, sure, the writing kept telling us that there was something between them, but it never bothered to show any kind of chemistry between them. Season 11 kept talking about how Amara wanted to keep Dean all alone, but why? What bonded the two of them? What did they have in common? It's hard to see any avenue that the two of them had a connection other than some crude pizza man jokes. But then they never even tore clothes off of each other. Thus, because the previous seasons never bothered to adequately explain or set up what Amara and Dean had together, in this episode, when Dean tells her, I would never hurt you, I can't help but scream, why? Of all the many, many women you've had in your life, Dean, what makes Amara so special? Along similar lines, Jack's revelation that he's becoming a suicide bomber again, like at the end of season 11, well, it would have had more impact if the season had bothered to take advantage of natural setups. In the first half of the season, there were discussions about the viability of locking Chuck away. The purpose of him then giving Sam a glimpse of the future was to reveal that if Chuck wasn't around, the forces of evil in the world would slowly and steadily gain an advantage. Then Jack is brought back, and we're told he has to gain power to eventually defeat Chuck. Given that the last test in this effort was him getting his soul back, there is a super obvious new plan. Have Jack defeat Chuck, and then replace him as the new god to take care of things. It, it's so obvious. I've joked about it on Twitter during my viewings. Then Jack ups and confesses to Castiel, and I realize we've never actually had this plan confirmed. In fact, we've never heard what the plan is on the show. So Castiel's reaction falls flat. Why? Because we have no idea what Castiel's beliefs or hopes were before that. Jack is back. We know Cass is happy. But then he never talks about this plan with Jack. He never discusses or has moments like, you know, Jack, when you're in charge around here, you need to make sure that... So this moment of him learning the truth of, oh no, I'm not replacing God, I'm just a suicide bomber, has no impact. For a story's revelation to have meaning and impact, you need to know what the characters it's directed at believed. We feel Luke Skywalker's pain when he learns the truth because we understand that before that, what he believed about his father. If this show had just leaned into what looked like the logical story plan, if it encouraged us to keep thinking about the most obvious plot solution and have the characters confirm, oh yeah, Jack will just become the new guy in charge, then it would have had a real surprise and a real impact on us to learn, oh no, we were wrong. It's hard to take this news seriously when we've literally had Jack die and come back to life twice last season well the second return didn't happen until this season anyway we also have to ask what does jack dying matter can't we just bring him back again this again goes back to why i caution the show against using the big empty too much all of this are problems that result from episodes before this one and it's hard to fault Gimme Shelter for flaws of execution when it was the setup that didn't do it right. There was a lot I wanted to like about this episode. It was great to see Dr. Sexy back, though I'll always know him as Roddy from Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda. The entire A plot revolving around Castiel and Jack working a case together is absolutely beautiful and proof that. They should have been doing this with Jack all along. Misha and Alexander were both given a great scene to really deliver their acting chops and generally nailed them, making the whole episode worth it. And like I said in my previous review, Monsters of the Weeks are best when they parallel and examine our characters. Gimme Shelter accomplishes this fairly well with the preacher and daughter struggle having some mirror to Castiel and Jax, as well as 
Castiel and Chuck. I'm also pleased with the general structure of the episode, having two storylines running with the A plot being Monster of the Week and the B plot being arc focused. Even if I'm not thrilled with the exact details of Sam and Dean's plot lines, I approve the structure of having this acknowledged and looked at. And I will admit, I could dispute some of the details. Like if anyone should understand my brother, no matter what, as Amara put it, it should be these two. Other than some of those, the scenes with those three were very well done, and I'm grateful that the show bothered to have those scenes between the brothers and Amaro's. So, in conclusion, I give this episode three shells out of five. Individual moments work really well, and the general structure of the episode is nearly ideal for a Monster of the Week one. But there were still a few serious flaws that worked against it, not all of them within the episode as well. Yes, I am aware of the irony that this episode's biggest flaws are the flaws of other episodes, but still, the punchline is the one that has to bear the remaining grades, so three shells it is. Well, folks, only five episodes remain, so let's get through this together.